Hello, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Tom Woodford, and I am the college counselor with Hilliard City Schools. Um, thank you for watching this video. This video is um, for uh, students and parents who were not able to make the uh, junior meeting we had last week. Or if you did attend that meeting and you want to just review a few things, um, that is the purpose of this meeting. So um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. I would love to meet with students and parents to talk about pathways to college. So, so let's talk about standardized testing. Um, sorry about that. So the ACT is a test that is given seven times a year. Um, students can begin to take these tests at any time. Uh, I encourage students to create a plan, and we're going to talk more about a testing plan very soon. Uh, but this, uh, the ACT, is a test that's made up of four sections, English, reading, math, and science. Um, it has a score up to 36, which is different than the SAT, which is made up of reading and writing and math. So there's two sections, which is broken down into two uh, subsections on each test. Starting January 1st of 2024, the SAT is going digital only, and it'll be much a much shorter test, about two hours and 14 minutes instead of over three hours. So um, the SAT is also a test that's offered seven times a year as well. Every school in the country, um, except for the state schools in the state of California, uh, will use either test. They don't prefer one test over the other. Um, so whatever test fits the students best, um, they, they should take. As I referenced the state schools in the state of California, those schools out there are test blind which means it's legislative law that they cannot use standardized test scores as a part of the um, admissions review. So all our, our juniors, hopefully they have already signed up for this uh, because it is way past the deadline to sign up for this, but our juniors who have signed up for the PSAT will take the PSAT on October 24th. That will be done um, during the school day, all of our current juniors took the 10th grade version, the PSAT 10, last spring. So all of our students have a College Board ID number. Um, they, they have an, um, a student account. And so they're able to, to look at past scores and get um, SAT review and prep there as well. All of our juniors will take the SAT during the school day um, in the month of April. Students and parents do not have to pay for this. The state of Ohio will pay for this. There is no writing section on it. Um, and it will be taken during the school day. It will be a digital test. Um, obviously, I did not update my slide here. Um, it will be a two hour and 14 minute test. So I referenced students creating a testing plan or a testing schedule, and they need to do that working backwards based on deadlines. And so when we think about a year from now, when these current juniors are going to be seniors, they have to look at the deadlines of when colleges when all of their applications are due. There's a common deadline, November 1st, that is a deadline for Ohio State. It's a deadline for Miami of Ohio, Case Western, many, many schools. And so knowing that deadline, that is a deadline that everything must be in by that date. The application must be in, the transcripts must be in, letters of recommendation, as well as test scores if students are going to apply with scores. There are some colleges out there like South Carolina and many others that offer that 
offer an October 15th early action deadline. So deadlines are different by each, each college. So when we create this plan, we need to work backwards. The last ACT that's guaranteed to meet all of the deadlines is the September test. The last SAT that's guaranteed to meet all of the early deadlines for next year will be the August test, okay? I get asked every year when students should be taking these. And so if your child is in pre-calculus, statistics, calculus, AP calculus, none of that is on the ACT or the SAT. So if they're in any of those classes, they can go ahead and begin to schedule taking those tests now. If your child is in Algebra 2 as a junior or Honors Algebra 2 as a junior, I would probably wait till spring to take that for the first time. Because on the ACT, I can use them as a perfect example. They have 60 math questions. Between 9 and 12 of them are Algebra 2 type and 4 are trigonometry type, which they'll get during that class. So um, if they're in Algebra 2 now, I would wait to begin to take these tests starting in the spring. So we've heard a lot about colleges being test optional. What does that mean? Test optional is where um, if students take ACT or SAT and their score does not reflect the type of student that they are, colleges allow students to apply without sending test scores. So colleges are, are making changes to this policy every year. Um, I know a lot of colleges in Ohio State will be um, reviewing uh, their decision over the last three or four years to be test optional again this spring to make a decision for next year. To get a list of all colleges that are test optional, students or parents can go to fairtest.org and you can get a complete list of, of colleges that are test optional. You know, um, as I said, test optional actually was a movement prior to COVID. And, you know, Wake Forest has been test optional for 19 years. The University of Chicago has been that way for six years and so on and so forth. And so um, some colleges uh, um, look at test scores more than others. Um, some schools value them more than others. Other schools only will use them if it is going to help a student. So, so again, there are other schools like Ohio University that have said, you know what, they're going to, they moved to being test optional three years ago, and they have said they will be um, test optional forever. And then the state schools in California, uh, like Cal Berkeley, Cal Fullerton, Cal Davis, schools like that, they are test blind. Schools like USC and Stanford, those are private schools. And so uh, they may require the um, ACT or the SAT, or they may be test optional. There are schools out there that are requiring them again, MIT, as well as um, the University of Tennessee. And so colleges are making those decisions every spring for the following year. So as we plan ahead, we need to think about what should our juniors be doing right now during this school year? And so your kids should be taking the PSAT um, October 24th. Uh, they should attend college meetings. If they didn't make it, they should watch this video. We will have another junior meeting in the spring, and that meeting will focus on the college application process. I'll show you what the Common App is going to look like, and we'll talk about deadlines and things like that. So next fall, as students have finished their junior year, when we send high school transcripts, um, it is going to include their freshman, sophomore, and junior classes and grades and their cumulative GPA made up of those three years of high school. 
They will also review what class of students are taking as a senior. So that's part of the application process. And many colleges ask for January grades, one to check to make sure they're still taking the classes they said they were going to take in the fall and to also see uh, that senioritis is not set in and just to take a look at how students are progressing through senior year. If your child feels they might be ready to begin taking some college courses while in high school, um, I will offer a College Credit Plus meeting on November 27th. That meeting will be at Darby at 6.30. That is a meeting that the student and parents should attend. Um, as students are taking AP classes this year, they will have the opportunity to take an AP exam during the first two full weeks of May. Uh, students should be signing up inside the College Board website to register for those AP exams that should be doing, they should be doing that right now. And then uh, students should be scheduling their ACT tests and their SAT. My advice to that is I feel students should take each one of those tests once, figure out which test fits them best and take that test two more times. Uh, because there's a thing called super scoring, and we, we will talk about that in a moment. I would also use spring break and any other times that we don't have school to go for students to start going and visiting college campuses. That is very important. And so, and then as students work through their year, they want to make sure that they follow up and, and take the AP exams this spring. And since we're talking about AP, I think it's important to understand how advanced placement works. Advanced placement courses are high school courses. They are not college courses. Students do not earn college credit from taking an AP class. They do not earn college credit from taking an AP exam. They get a score. They get a score between one and five. And that score stays with them in each of the um, classes, and then in each of the AP exams that they take. And then the university that they go to, they have their own policy that what they will give credit for from their own courses and how many credits that class is worth based on an AP score. But kids don't come in with any credit. They only get credit from the university that they're going to attend and they get credit from their college and credits and courses from their school. So that is important to understand about AP. So <clears throat> coming up this Sunday, October 8th, is the Suburban College Fair at Otterbein from 1 to 3.30. Myself and Mr. Maggie are the co-chairs of the Suburban College Fair. We'll have between 130 and 140 colleges there. I would encourage uh, students and parents to come to this meeting. Uh, uh, each school will have their own table. Students and parents can ask questions. They can pick up documents to take home. There will be another college fair on February 3rd at the Ohio Expo Center downtown. Uh, that will be a quite a, a large college fair as well. Um, I will be sending out information about that throughout the month of January in February. And then on April 11th, we will have an 11th grade um, college application meeting at 6.30 p.m. at Darby. I will go over what the application process is for students. The Common App, which is an application that's used by over a thousand colleges, that goes live on August 1st every year. And so I will make sure that all of you get to see the different parts of the Common App so everybody's up to date on what that's gonna look like. Important terms. It's important that we understand the terminology that is used um, through this college process. And so um, early decision, only about 18% of universities 
use this application type. This is a binding application. So if students choose to apply to a school early decision, you can only apply to one school that way. You are telling them, them that you are, that they are your number one school. You are committing yourself to them. So if they admit you, um, that's where you will be going. Uh, by rule, you're supposed to cancel all of the rest of your applications if you get admitted to your early decision college. What is important though, many colleges will let students out of this agreement after financial aid has been filled out and it just doesn't seem to work out. So Ohio State does not offer early decision. Ohio State offers early action. Early action is an earlier deadline. It's also tied to their scholarship deadline, which is November 1st. And then students will find out earlier if they are admitted to OSU. Students can apply to as many schools as they want, early action. Restricted early action is a type of application that's only um, used between 12 and 15 colleges out there. It's non-binding, but uh, you are telling them that they are uh, number one on your list of those 12 to 15 colleges. A regular application um, admission deadline is usually much later in February for Ohio State. So students are still using the common app. They did not want to apply in September or October. Maybe they wanna take a later ACT or SAT. They can apply during the holidays and they would just apply prior to the regular application deadline. So I had referenced super scoring earlier. So I advise students to take the ACT and SAT each once and then um, choose which test fits them best and take that test two more times because some schools out there like Case Western, Miami of Ohio will super score. So what is super scoring is, let's say your child takes the ACT three times, they get a 28, 28, and a 27. Ohio State says they have a 28 because that, that's the highest composite. Miami and Case Western might say they have a 29 or a 30 because they'll take the highest subscores across all of those tests. And they'll take the highest English, the highest reading, the highest math and highest science and create a new composite um, score. So that is super scoring. That's the reason why I ask students to take those tests more than once. No more than three times though. Again, the common app, most of your kids are gonna fill out that application over 1,000 colleges and over 38 schools in Ohio use this one um, application. And then there's a thing called a member page. That's where um, kids add those colleges inside of the Common App. And then every university will have their own list of questions specific to them. Colleges are gonna review students. And as you go on tours and visits, you're, you are gonna hear this term. It's called holistic review. The holistic review is they're looking at all parts of the student's application um, from what courses students have taken compared to what a school offers, ACT scores, their grades, their volunteer, their activities with school, activities outside of school, volunteering, leadership, all of those things, that is a holistic review. So how are students going to apply to colleges? So <clears throat> there are four different types of them. One, we've talked about it a, a few different times, the common application. Um, then there is a university specific application. And so like schools like Ohio University, in Bowling Green, they have their own application. They also use the Common App. Uh, they only want one application per student. Either one is fine. One is not better than the other. There is a universal application, which I've never seen because only 50 colleges use it, but all 50 colleges also use the Common App. 
so we've never seen it. <clears throat> and then there is a coalition app, and very few schools use this now. Um, the numbers have been changing quite a bit. There's been problems with it. All of the colleges that use the coalition app also use the common app. And so most of our kids will be using that. College visits. And so it's important that students are getting onto a college campus so they can figure out if this is the right place for them. The way that students schedule that or parents schedule that for their kids, you go on a school's website, a lot of times right on the homepage, it'll say schedule a visit, or you click on the admissions tab and scroll down to uh, the visit tab there. And then you will see a calendar, you'll choose a date, you'll choose a time. I encourage everyone to do that. Every time that your child has a contact either on campus or at a college fair or something else, the colleges keep track of how often they have had contacts with your child. Have they answered emails that's been, that have been sent to them? All of those kind of things are tracked because colleges have to create a system to see how, how interested are you in their college. And many colleges use that as a part of the holistic review as well. So just going to campus, walking around is not a college visit. The college does not know that you're there. So every year we're, we're very fortunate that we have over a hundred college representatives come to Hilliard schools and they're here to meet our kids. And so kids can, can look at that, go into school links, click on uh, school events, and they'll see all of the different colleges listed there. That's changing every week. And then if students see a school that they are interested in, they can sign up for it. We will send a pass for them. They will get to ask questions. They'll hear a presentation. They'll pick up materials to bring home to share with mom and dad. <clears throat> so financial aid, financial aid is changing. You guys are lucky right now as uh, parents of juniors. Uh, the, the financial aid FAFSA document, the free application for federal student aid, uh, goes live on October 1st, and it will for you this year because there's major changes to it. It's not ready, and they're saying it won't be ready till the month of December. They'll have all those kinks worked out throughout this year, so it'll be ready to go for you. But what's important for you to understand, you'll be filling out the 2526 FAFSA. You will use your 2023 tax information to fill out that form. I will have a financial aid meeting for you next September, the last week of September, to get you ready for all of that. So financial aid terms. So next year, when you go to fill out this form, you will go to studentaid.gov. Do not go to fafsa.com or studentaid.com. It is the .gov website. Uh, those of the parents that have filled out FAFSA in the past, you were given an EFC, the Estimated Family Contribution. That's being changed to the SAI, the Student Aid Index. AKA, it's basically what the federal government feels you can afford for college. You're not going to agree with it at all, but it is uh, become it becomes baseline data that the universities can use to create a financial aid package for your child. Many of the private schools, especially the private schools along the East Coast and West Coast, and the private schools here in Ohio as well, many of them use another document called the CSS profile. This is another document that will look at the family assets to use to be able to come up with that financial aid package. And if you wanna get an idea of what the true cost is at a college, uh, you know, if you go on Kenyon, Kenyon College's website, you look at their tuition and fees and things and you see it's $85,000 a year. It is $85,000 a year the most expensive school in the US, um, but very few kids pay that. You can go on to the net price calculator, which must be within two clicks of the homepage, put in some basic information, and it'll give you feedback on what 
an estimate of what the true cost might be to go to that school. So here are some sample questions. I think it's always important that students and parents go on college visits and they're asking questions about opportunities, asking questions about, um, are you test optional? If you are, what was the admit rate for kids who were test optional last year? Um, what type of people teach your classes? Are they professors? Are they um, graduate students? What's the middle 50% for your ACT and SAT score? Do you have internships or co-ops? Do you have work study as a financial aid opportunity? And, and do you have opportunities to study abroad? Uh, do you have a scholarship deadline? If so, when? Do you have separate scholarships for incoming freshmen that have their own application? If so, where can we find them? So here is a list of some basic questions that, that you might want to ask as you go on tours. And social media, um, parents, I know you've been working with your kids for years on this. You know, colleges are held accountable for the students they bring to campus. And if something happens on there, on their campus and they look back at a student's social media feed and they see that there's been a pattern of these kind of behaviors in the past, well, the university is held accountable for that. So universities will be um, many times looking at students' social media pages as a part of the holistic review. And so um, if they need to create a new email that, that sounds a little bit more adult-like, I would encourage them to do that as well. So what are colleges looking for? They're looking for, they're gonna review your child in the holistic review like we have spoken about. GPA, ACT scores, SAT scores, classes taken, so on and so forth. All of these things are very, very, very important. And so all of these aspects are um, equal in the um, evaluation from each school. There are things that students cannot control in this application process. What they can control though, are the classes they've taken, the grades they've earned, have they volunteered, do they have any leadership opportunities, have they joined any clubs in school and out of school, and demonstrated interest, which means have they gone and visited campus. Those are all part of this, Students can control all of those. There are parts of this admissions process that they cannot. Um, geographics, a school like Ohio State, they're going to admit students from all 88 counties. They're going to admit students from all 50 states. Um, they're going to admit students who can pay full price. They're going to admit students that don't pay anything. They're going to admit students right there in, in the middle. And they're also going to admit students that have special talents that the university deems a need for them. So I encourage students between now and April that they need to be signing up to see the college reps at the high school. They need to be going on virtual tours on college's websites. They need to be going to college fairs. They need to be visiting those schools face-to-face, -face, come up with a testing plan and begin to think about what they might wanna study. These are all things that they should be doing between now and April. Then when we meet again in April, we will be able to talk about a plan between that date, April 11th, and August 1st when the Common App goes live. If you need to follow me or if you need to contact me, feel free to send me an email that's here at the top or follow me on Twitter, now called X, at, at Woodford underscore Tom. I'm always posting things on there every day that have to do with college admissions. And uh, if you ever have any questions, any thoughts, I would love to meet with you. Um, just feel free to reach out. Have a great day and enjoy junior year. Thank you.